Good morning. Leading the announcements, we were hoping to have our final outdoor service next Sunday at Triangle Park. We took a little look at the weather. <laughs> I think we're going to be indoors next week, and I don't think there will be any argument about that. And also, our new uh, video system should be launching next week also, so we're sort of eager to kind of get going with that. And uh, Mary will be the point person on that. She will learn. I mean, anyone's welcome to learn how to use the system, but Mary will be the, the uh, she'll be the director of photography on that one. Yeah, we'll, exactly, we will see. The coat drives, as you can see, the coat rack back there is growing. If you, if you actually put your coat there, um, I'm sorry, because it's, it's now going to Shepherd of the Hills. But that's where our, our coat drive, we're gonna go through the end of the month and try to get, uh, our coat challenges to try to get 25 coats by the end of this month. There's 13 back there right now. And there's already 13, so we're moving right along. Um, also in our prayer updates, we've got Brian Baker and Park Leachman and Steve Milligan. Uh, all who are recovering from procedures uh, that take place in the last week. They join the other names that we have on our prayer list. Wednesday night Bible study is moving along quite nicely. Meal begins at 5.30, study at 6. We're moving through the uh, why is that? daily bread. The daily bread, unity in Jesus. And it's been, the conversation has been very very informative. We don't, we don't solve a lot of a lot of problems, but we might create more than we solve. But we certainly have a, a vigorous conversation that opens our minds and about just how to practice our faith in a rapidly changing world. So that is always beneficial. Anything else that anyone would like to highlight or underscore on our list? It's really good to see you, Heather Hardy. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Marilyn? God be with you. 
and also with you. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that your grace may always proceed and follow us, that we may continually be given to good works through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us join together in our opening hymn, number 55. Hallelujah. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright in the congregation. His work is full of majesty and splendor, and his righteousness endures forever. He gives food to those who fear him. He is ever mindful his covenant. The work of his hands are faithfulness and justice. All his commandments are sure. He sent redemption to his people. He commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name.
through the whole Sunday morning. I'm reading from the Old Testament, 2 Kings, chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, and 7 through 15. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man, and in high favor with his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now, the Arameans, on one of their raids, had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my lord, with the prophet who is Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give death for life? that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's home. Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the leprosy. Are not Abaddon and Farpah, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in a rage. But his servants approached and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more then, when all he said to you was wash and be clean? So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company. He came and stood before him and said, Now, I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. The epistle today from the New Testament is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 15. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, a descendant of David, that is my gospel for which I suffer hardship, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, so that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is sure, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Remind them of this, and warn them that before God, that they are to avoid wrangling over words, which does not which does no good, but only ruins those who are listening. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved by him, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly explaining the word of truth. Let us rise for the gospel. The gospel for this morning the 18th Sunday of Pentecost is taken from Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. 
on the way towards Jerusalem. He was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered the village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priest. They went, and they were made clean. Then one of them, after he saw that he was healed, turned back and, praising God with a loud voice, prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean, but the other not? Where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of the Holy Word. Let us pray. God of grace, glory, power, and life, we thank you for this day that you've given us, and for this opportunity to gather here that we might kindle our hearts once again with the reflection upon your word that brings to us inspiration, motivation, and a desire to make a contribution with the wisdom that you've given us to the world that you've called us to serve. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you. May you bless, keep, and guide us now and always. In the passage that Bob shared with us today from 2 Timothy, we have Paul reminding Timothy and us as to what our motivation is as Christians. Paul now is a prisoner, and he is in chains, and he Sometimes people get tired of Paul going on about his hardships and going on about his sufferings and going on about his inconveniences. But this is all to make a point that Paul, having realized that once he entered into the service as an apostle, that even though the message that he was bearing and the message that he was bringing to the surrounding region was a powerful, life-transforming message, there were still audiences and individuals who did not want to hear it. Not much has changed between the first century and the 21st century. There are still individuals in our time and place who do not want to hear this message, don't want to have anything to do with the church or church types. Some things never change. But Paul is using all of this as motivation for Timothy because he doesn't want Timothy to get discouraged. The past two weeks we have been looking at both 1st and 2nd Timothy as a means of seeing an older, more established individual in the faith who is trying to encourage and shape the faith of one who is coming up. So now Paul feels it's important for him to, to be explicit and clear. So Timothy understands that, first of all, the message that you are bearing is a good message. It's a vital message. It's a necessary and essential message for your time and for, for the future. You will get discouraged because you will encounter individuals who will become enemies of the cross, who will resist that message, who will dive into strange beliefs, and who will try to hurt you. Paul says this. Paul goes, I endure all of these sufferings for the sake of the person who called me to be an apostle, Jesus Christ. So our motivation for being and maintaining our, our profession of faith is the head and the founder of our faith, who is Jesus. Now, quoting from 2 Timothy this morning, I want to pull these passages, verses 11 through 13. The saying is sure, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure with him, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. And if we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. There's a consistency that Paul says that's in the nature and the character of Jesus, that Jesus, knowing full well his entire reason for his ministry, knowing full well the service that he has called his disciples in, if they should break, falter, grow weary, Jesus' consistency is enough that it will sort of, well, carry him through. But as we attach ourselves to his person, and Paul is encouraging us to do this, he's encouraging Timothy, 
and he's encouraging any follower and would be follower of Christ to attach themselves to his personage in order that we might draw from the same wellspring of life that he draws from. And again, I, I love whenever there's a scripture that comes up that I can always point to our covenant. You don't have to go there, although it is easy to find. But here's what's interesting. In the very last uh, paragraph that we have here, we will consecrate our time, talent, substance, and as influence as heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Here in our own covenant, we are reminded once again of this sort of joint inheritance that we have because we attach ourselves to the persons of Christ. This is what Paul is talking about with Timothy. It is like when you attach yourself to the person of Christ, everything that, all the doors that he opens will be open for us. Right? So he, let him go in first, let him uh, pave the way, clear the path, and then we can follow behind him. So when he says, if we died with him, then we will also rise with him. Jesus went to the cross on our behalf, so therefore his death ushers us into new life. But what's, what I want us to focus on today is, first of all, our, not only the source and the origin of our motivation, but this interesting tidbit that Paul picks up in the second paragraph towards the end of today's passage. Paul reinforces his point to adhere to Christ by the example of encouraging Timothy as a young preacher to remind people to avoid wrangling over words. And this, is a, this is a quote here. Avoid wrangling over words which does no good but only ruins those who are listening. This is a caveat that anyone who is a public speaker needs to be exceedingly mindful of because it only ruins those who are listening. Now, this is, uh, this is where I take a little departure here because I have been, you wouldn't know this because I'm a preacher. When, when you don't see me during the course of the week, it's because I'm practicing this, this next spiritual art. There's an important role in the practice of faith for silence. And this is not often spoken of and encouraged in, in our, our houses of worship or in, even in our Bible studies. In the 1976 book, The Genesee Diary, the late priest and author Henri Nouwen recounted the importance of silence during his seven-month stay at the Abbey of Genesee in upstate New York at the Trappistine Monastery. And I want to read uh, an entry that he made in this diary on September 12, 1974, and specifically referring to his thoughts on silence. I'll let, I'll let Nouwen's words speak. Thursday, September 12, 1974. Silence. Indeed, silence is very important for me. During the last week, with a trip to New Haven, full of discussions and verbal exchanges, with many seemingly necessary telephone conversations, and with quite a few talks with the monks, silence has become less and less a part of my life. With the diminishing silence, a sense of inner contamination developed. In the beginning, I didn't know why I felt somewhat dirty, dusty, impure, but it dawned on me that it might be the lack of silence that may have been the main cause. I am becoming aware that with words, ambiguous feelings enter into my life. It almost seems as if it's impossible to speak and not sin. Even in the most elevated discussion, something enters that seems to pollute the atmosphere and in some strange way, speaking makes me less alert, less open, and more self-centered. St. Benedict is very clear about the importance of silence. He feels that silence is better than speaking, about good things. He seems to imply that it is practically impossible to speak about good things without being touched by the evil ones, too. Silence needs to become a real part of my life. When I return to teaching, in much speaking, thou shalt not avoid sin. Proverbs 10, 19. Many people ask me to speak, but nobody has invited me for silence. Still, I realize the more I speak, the more I will need silence to remain faithful to what I say. People expect too much from speaking and too little from silence. 
Let's take a moment to observe that last, that last sentence of Nouns. People expect too much from speaking and too little from silence. And I find that even in the context of worship services, and where, where there are moments of silence, none of us want that silence to go on too long. In fact, it's, 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 it, we're, we're glad when the furnace kicks on because then at least we have a little bit of ambient sound or in the summer season when a Harley rolls up and down Main Street or a particularly rattly <coughs> trailer. I mean, we, we, we like the silence to be broken with some sort of noise so at least we don't have to deal with the noise that's going on in our heads, with the constant din, the constant drone of things that must be done, and all the thoughts that seem to invade us whenever we get just a little bit of taste of the quiet. Even in, in the out of doors, we, we long for some bird song or some rustling of leaves or anything, because silence, silence is too arresting. It's too profound, it's too poignant, it's too real. Now, Paul might appreciate these lines from now because he understands that in the wrangling of words, and we know about the wrangling of words, everybody has their truth, they have their opinions, we want to be right, we want to have the last say, we want to be the smartest one in the room, and after a while that can become so burdensome. It really is burdensome being the smartest one in the room. You know about that. Because at one time, at some point in our lives, we've always been the smartest one in the room. We just wonder why everyone else just isn't as sharp as we are. But we wrangle over words and we realize that we get no further in our labors because sometimes we can be alone in our opinions, can be isolated in our truth, can be very lonely at the top, the top that we've created for ourselves. So Paul realizes that, that young Timothy, you are going to be a preacher. You're going to go and carry this gospel. Do not be confused about what you think is your own intelligence what you think is your own portion, and the individuals that you were called to serve. All have a share in this gospel. All have equal and ample portion in this gospel. And if we get into too much theological debate, too much civil debate, too much posturing on the basis of age and experience, we're going to lose the thread of what is most valuable and most important and we're also going to lose Jesus in the shuffle of the wrangling of words and find out, hey, what's our motivation? What are we doing? It's very easy to us to lose our way because we're so, we're so keen on defending this or that platform. Silence. Paul is encouraging in his own way Timothy to remind people that in the wrangling of the words, they miss the true kernel and the wisdom, which is to follow the call and the invitation of the founder of the church, to look upon Jesus and to learn from him, and maybe not to get so caught up in our particulars. It is only through sincere and honest reflection that we can draw more closer to an authentic expression of the faith that we proclaim. I have tried at various times to introduce opportunities for silence in the congregation. During the time that I've been here, it's, it's been hit and miss. Sometimes we've had some centering prayer groups. Sometimes there'll be an opportunity for maybe like the odd taste a service. But again, it's because our communities are so hardwired to be filled with words, to be filled with action, to be filled with deeds, because we cannot, that's the only way we demonstrate progress. The only, the only way we can demonstrate progress is to constantly be in motion, whether we are physically in motion or just the motion of our mouth, the motion of our language. So unfortunately, we have created our worshipful spaces as just more noisy, active spaces. And the only time that we can be somewhat familiar with silence is just as we are nodding off in the midst of some boring television, some boring film, and we're just, just about ready to nod off into sleep. It's the only time that we can steal a little bit of silence. We don't actually take time 
for intentional silence. I'm thinking it might just be time for us to rediscover that lost art of being still, being quiet, not having to be anywhere with our thoughts or to be anywhere at all. I am reminded of the time when the prophet Elijah ran away because the king was seeking his life and he went and he spirited himself away in a cave. And God says, when the time comes, I will send for you and you'll know and recognize my spirit. And there was a storm outside of the cave. Raging winds and powerful rain. And it says that the voice of the Lord was not in the storm. And then after the storm came, eerie, eerie quiet. And Elijah wrapped himself in his mantle. <laughs> and he went to the mouth of the cave for the voice of the Lord was in the stillness. And this is something that we miss. We miss those opportunities in which God can break through. Does not the prophet write, be still and know that I am God? Does not now realize that even though he was a Yale professor and even though he had students and status, it was his quiet moments that actually were the most profound. We could deepen our faith by being more still, more quiet, more introspective. The best sides of our faith come from the self-reflection, come from the times in which we just sit in a quiet meditation reflecting perhaps on a scriptural passage until God breaks forth the wisdom that we've long been seeking, that we couldn't find in the noise. See, the motorcycle just went by. I'm never wrong. <coughs> and I'm never wrong about the motorcycles. I'm wrong about a great many other things, but not the motorcycles that rumble up and down the street. So here's some takeaways. First of all, and they're very simple. Our motivation for our faith, Jesus sets the standard of our conduct, shows us how to worship God. That's, that's number one. So why do we come to church? We come to church not you know, to see our friends, to have fellowship. That's secondary. We come to church because there was one who showed us how to worship God, Jesus Christ. And through worship and through prayer and through Bible study, we can access him. We can access his person. We can access that spirit. So that is our primary reason. That is our primary motivation. Paul says that to Timothy, it has not changed. But two, the way that we maintain and perfect our faith is not through constant, empty, busyness, work for work's sake, but through a silent reflection that will allow us to shape and cultivate that faithful witness, which ultimately changes hearts and minds and brings everyone into the household. Let us join together in our response of him, number 410.
please be seated. As we gather our minds together, as we prepare to enter the silence, do not be afraid. For in that silence, we find our truer selves. We are comforted by the assurance that God is with us, that we are not alone in that silence. And, and we can focus and center our mind upon the many things the many concerns, petitions, individuals that we are praying for, that we know that we are in this conversation with God and that we, we are being, we're being heard. Let's pray. transformation that is always open to us to grow in a deeper intimacy with you so we can be mindful of your call to serve and be reminded of the gifts that we have and the opportunities that abound today we set our, our prayer concerns before you and we ask that for those that we lift up in our hearts, those in hospital, those in recovery, that our prayers would settle upon them, strengthening bodies and minds, rejuvenating spirits, giving the assurance that our petitions and our intercessions are not offered up in vain. That when we pray, a profound change takes place in us and in the lives of those who are enveloped by those prayers. We are reanimated. So we ask that you would lay your blessing upon those <coughs> name is we. Would you be with Mark and Steve? Would you be with Faith's brother-in-law? Continue to bring strength and healing to heaven. We are seated. We have great milestones in that. Just out and about. So we thank you for that. Your consistency is something that we envy, but it is not impossible for us. We just hope that we can be more plugged into you so we can exhibit the type of demeanor that Jesus demonstrated. Incredible assurance of faith. We ask that you would continue to be with individuals in Florida as they make their way through a rather chaotic experience. And we just ask that that your faith would continue to inform ongoing rescue efforts, rebuilding, keeping tempers under control. There's a great deal of need and a great deal of questions that are being raised. And I don't want anyone who's in that experience to feel 
as if they're being overlooked, ignored, or important. We gather here with concerns closer to home. Things taking place in our own families. And we ask that you would be mindful of the prayers that we offer to you today. Both our joys and our concerns, we lift them up to you. We ask that in your mercy that you would hear our prayers. Receive these prayers that we have spoken unto you, and remember us as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. Let us join together in our covenant. We covenant with the Lord 
and with one another, and do bind ourselves in the presence of God to walk together in His holy ways. We will strive to be doers of the word and not hearers only, to be firm in faith, quickened in hope, and constant in charity. And we will consecrate our time, talent, substance, and influence as heirs of God and joint heirs. <clears throat> Be with us, loving God, in ways we have even begun to imagine. Speak to our hearts. Cultivate in us the sense of our own worthiness. Not only worthy to receive this meal, but worthy to go forth and to share the light of your truth. We are exactly who you need us to be. We are right where you want us to be for this moment and this time. So unburden us from those heavy thoughts, the vexations, the troubles that we have had, which sometimes are just so hard to extricate ourselves from. And with this meal, bring the renewal that we need to be resolute, to re-engage to celebrate this life that you've given us to live. We ask these things in your name. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, and celebrated the Passover meal, took bread, gave thanks, offered it to his disciples, and says, This is my body. I give it to you. Remember. says this is the covenant of blood shed for the nation of sins. As often as we do eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we do become the Lord's death for the rest of the year. Ministering to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I offer the sacrament of war.
prayer of thanksgiving. Again, God, we, we thank you for allowing us to come forward, to break through the ego, to embrace that rich humility that lets us know that we are not a people who don't have needs. We don't have a need for the grace that you provide. And who are comforted by that grace that you provided. For that uplift, that reminder that we indeed are your hands and your feet. That we are the agents, that we are the sons and daughters of light. We thank you for that. Because nowhere in the world can we experience that rich love that we find in you. So let us do what we can and what we may as we carry that light and that truth into a weary world and hopefully bring some rays of hope where we may. We join together in our closing hymn, number 586. <laughs> God embrace you, guide you forth, secure you with the assurance that you do not walk nor operate alone, infuse in you the energy and resources and mindfulness to go forth, to carry forth the light of the gospel's truth. Be at peace.
both in your waking moments and sleeping moments. Be comfortable with the silence, for the silence informs and strengthens your faith. Go in peace, be at peace. Thank you.